There is an inn just a short distance from this gate where I left my horse. Shall we go there? I readily agreed, and upon reaching the inn we secured a private room. I proceeded to share with this man every detail of my life that was intertwined with Welbeck and Watson. My account was thorough, comprehensive, and explicit, aiming to dispel any doubts he may have had regarding my honesty and integrity. In Williams, I discovered a straightforward, kind-hearted individual with a trusting and affectionate disposition. Upon finishing my tale, he expressed his genuine shock and sorrow for Watson's fate. When I asked him about his own and his sister's circumstances, he revealed that they had been in a dire state until the recovery of their inheritance. Their creditors had shown mercy and kindness by not allowing the suspicious circumstances surrounding Watson's disappearance to outweigh his previously proven honesty. Despite the challenges they faced, they never gave up hope of finding their missing relative. I recounted the events that had transpired at the home of Mrs. Maurice and inquired about the history and character of the family. They have treated you exactly as anyone who knows them would expect, he replied. The mother is narrow-minded, ignorant and greedy. The eldest daughter, whom you met, shares many of those same qualities. As she ages, the resemblance between them will only grow stronger. At present, her pride and bad temper are her most prominent traits. The youngest daughter, on the other hand, is nothing like the rest of her family. Where they are quick to anger, she is patient. Where they are demanding, she is humble. Where they are selfish, she is generous. Where they are lazy and ignorant, she is studious and skilled. It's rare to come across a young lady as kind-hearted and resilient as Miss Fanny Maurice, who has faced more than her fair share of hardships. The eldest daughter always got what she wanted from her parents through threats and coercion, but the younger one refused to resort to the same tactics. As a result, she endured hardships that would have been humiliating and frustrating for any other girl of her station. But for her, they only provided opportunities for her most admirable qualities to shine through, her fortitude and generosity. Despite their greed and cruelty, she never once complained. For the blessings they had provided, existence and a virtuous upbringing, she acknowledged gratitude was owed. However, what they chose to withhold was their own prerogative, and she held no claim over their decisions. She had no shame in relying on her own industry for sustenance. Ever since their fortunes were shaken by Watson's disappearance, they had allowed her to pursue this path, and she now earned a living by teaching music in Baltimore. Despite not belonging to the highest social echelons, she was widely respected and admired. But won't the recovery of this money improve her circumstances? I inquired. It is hard to say, he replied. I am inclined to believe it won't. It won't change her mother's character. Her pride may resurface, and she may force Miss Fanny to abandon her newfound profession, which would be a regrettable change. So what good has been achieved by returning the money? I questioned. If pleasure is considered good, then you have undoubtedly bestowed a great deal upon the Morrises. At least the mother and two of the daughters will experience pleasure, the only kind their natures can truly appreciate. It may not be the same as lifting them out of destitution, which wasn't the case as they had other means to sustain themselves apart from their Jamaican property. But wait, Williams interrupted himself, suddenly recalling something. Have you claimed the reward that was promised to the person who restored these bills? What reward? I inquired. A substantial sum of one thousand dollars. It was publicly pledged by Mrs. Morris and Hemmings, her husband's executor. Truly, I responded. That detail escaped my notice, and I'm surprised that it did. Is it too late to rectify the oversight? Then you have no qualms about accepting the reward? He asked. Absolutely not. Could you suspect me of being so peculiarly rigid in my principles? I questioned. Yes, but I'm uncertain why. The story you just shared led me to anticipate some irrational scruple on your part. Some believe that being hired or bribed to fulfill our duty is degrading, he explained. But this is no bribe to me. I would have acted exactly as I did even if no reward had been promised. In truth, I never even thought about the reward until you brought it up. However, now that you've reminded me, I would gladly see it fulfilled. It is only just for the Morrises to honor their commitment in this regard. For someone in my circumstances, the money would be highly beneficial. If these individuals were poor, or generous and deserving, or if I were already wealthy, I might be less concerned about them withholding it. But given the circumstances of both parties involved, I believe it would be a grave injustice for them to withhold it, and for me to refuse it, I explained. 
I'm afraid that injustice will indeed be committed on their part, Williams replied. It's a pity that you initially approached Mrs. Morris. Nothing can be expected from her greed unless it is forcibly taken from her through legal action. I will never resort to such force, I asserted. If you had gone to Hemmings first, I believe you could have expected payment. He is not a mean-spirited man. He must understand that a thousand dollars is a small sum to give for forty thousand. Perhaps it may not be too late yet. I am well acquainted with him, and if you agree, I can accompany you to him this evening and present your claim. Gratefully accepting his offer, I joined him and went to meet Hemmings as planned. It became apparent that Hemmings had been in contact with Mrs. Maurice earlier in the day and had been informed of this transaction. He had anticipated a visit from me for this very purpose. As Williams explained the details of my claim, I felt the intense scrutiny of Mr. Hemmings upon me. His stern, unyielding expression gave me little hope for a favorable outcome. His silence and perplexity after Williams finished speaking only confirmed my despair. To be sure, he finally spoke, the contract was explicit. To be sure, Mr. Slaught fulfilled his obligations. The bills are complete and intact. However, Mrs. Morris is the one who must pay the reward according to the terms of the contract, and she refuses to do so. But legally she can be compelled to pay, Williams interjected. Perhaps, Hemmings conceded, but I tell you plainly that she will not do so willingly. Legal action may have other consequences beyond just delay. Questions will be raised about the history of these papers. Watson disappeared a year ago. People will wonder where these papers have been all this time and how you came to possess them. I understand the curiosity, I said. I have nothing to hide and would gladly reveal the truth. However, the truth about these papers has no bearing on my claim. Whether a legally binding contract is fulfilled does not depend on personal preferences or opinions. I am not trying to hide anything, and I am eager to reveal the truth. You are correct, Hemmings agreed. Curiosity is natural but incidental in this case. I have no desire for it to harm your claim. So, Mr. Hemmings, Williams interjected again, you believe that legal action is the only recourse for Martin Slaught? To be sure, Mrs. Morris will only pay under compulsion, Hemmings replied. Perhaps I should have been more astute in recognizing my own self-interest. While I was willing to give, I should have also been ready to receive. As it stands, I will have to be satisfied with the assistance of the law. Any attorney would be willing to pursue the case on the condition of receiving half of the recovered sum. As we were about to take our leave, Hemmings asked us to wait for a moment. He acknowledged that, strictly speaking, the reward was meant to be paid by the person who received the papers. However, he admitted that my claim was indeed fair. He had the deceased Mr. Maurice's money in his possession, and the very bills we were discussing were in his hands. Therefore, he would pay me what I was due, and bear the consequences of this act of justice himself. He had been prepared for this, and handed me a check for the agreed-upon amount, asking me to sign the receipt. This unexpected and pleasing decision was followed by an invitation to supper, during which our host treated us with great affability and kindness. Discovering that I was the one responsible for Williams's good fortune, as well as Mrs. Maurice's, and hearing from Williams himself of his complete conviction of my integrity, Hemmings discarded all reserve and distance towards me. He inquired about my prospects and desires, and expressed his willingness to assist me. I reciprocated his openness with equal candor and frankness. I am poor, I confessed. I had to borrow money from a friend just to cover my expenses in coming here. I am indebted to this friend in many ways, and can only hope to repay them with gratitude and future services. Coming here, I expected only to accumulate more debt and sink deeper into poverty. However, fortunately, the outcome has made me wealthy. This moment has granted me at least a state of sufficiency. What? Do you consider a thousand dollars sufficient? He exclaimed. More than sufficient, I replied confidently. After parting ways with Hemmings, I accepted Williams's invitation to stay at his sister's house during my time in Baltimore. There were multiple reasons why I decided to extend my stay. The accounts I had heard about Miss Fanny Maurice had sparked a strong desire to meet her in person. She had a deep affection for Mrs. Watson, which made it easy for me to arrange a meeting through her. I've never been one to hold back or be reserved, even with people I don't particularly admire. And with those who captured my admiration and affection, it was impossible for me to be anything but open. By the end of our second meeting, both these women knew every significant event of my life and understood my thoughts and opinions on various subjects, especially when it concerned them. 
Every topic unrelated to them felt dull and lifeless in comparison. Gaining their attention and getting them to open up in return was effortless. I made inquiries and set an example, and Mrs. Watson and Miss Morris readily shared their stories with me. Mrs. Watson recounted her youth, her marriage, and the anxieties caused by her husband's disappearance. Miss Morris didn't shy away from expressing her opinions on important matters and gave me a thorough understanding of her current situation. This level of interaction was incredibly captivating. It filled my heart with a sense of exhilaration. I felt like I was in my true element, experiencing the delights of existence. The pleasure of conversing with kind and genuine souls was a novel experience for me. Time passed by in a blur, and before I knew it, a fortnight had gone by. Despite being away from my old friends, I kept up a regular correspondence with Stevens, sharing every detail with him. My friend's kinsman had made a full recovery and was able to return home soon after. His first priority was to help Carlton, who had fallen into debt. After much persuasion, Carlton agreed to take advantage of the laws that protected insolvent debtors. He surrendered all his possessions, except for his clothes and tools, and was granted a full discharge. With the help of his sister, Carlton resumed his writing career and his cheerful disposition. They were able to make a decent living through their hard work. I was eager to return home, mainly because I was concerned about Clemenza Lodi. However, my friend had already taken care of her. He visited her at Mrs. Villas's and found her in a state of deep melancholy. She had recently lost her child, and the death of Welbeck had only added to her grief. She was completely dependent on those around her, who treated her with kindness, but couldn't alleviate her suffering. My friend gained her trust and convinced her to come and stay with him. Mrs. Wentworth and Mrs. Fielding had their reservations, but he persuaded them to take on the responsibility of caring for Clemenza's well-being. Thanks to his kindness and persuasive arguments, Clemenza found a new home and a family that cared for her. They condescended to show great curiosity about me and displayed some interest in my well-being. They even promised to welcome me back as a friend when I returned. Reluctantly, I bid farewell to my newfound companions and made my way back to Philadelphia. Before I could embark on my planned path of study and employment under the guidance of Stevens, there remained a crucial task to personally assess the circumstances of Eliza Hadwin, and if possible, rescue my father from his unfortunate situation. My father's condition weighed heavily on my mind. I envisioned him consumed by destructive desires, reduced to poverty, confined in a wretched prison, and condemned to the company that nurtured his depraved inclinations. I pondered various strategies to alleviate his predicament. A small sum could secure his release from prison, but what would become of him afterward? How could his idle habits be cured? How could he be shielded from the corrupting influence of society? And how could I secure a sustainable means of support for him while also addressing my own needs and the responsibilities I owe to others? Advising and setting a good example had proven futile. Only through restraint could he be kept away from the temptations of rowdiness and debauchery. The absence of money would not hinder his extravagance and wastefulness. He would turn to credit until it was exhausted. Then he would find himself back in prison, requiring the same means of rescue to be repeated, thereby lining the pockets of the most worthless individuals, agents of drunkenness and blasphemy. This cycle would offer no lasting benefits to my father, the primary recipient of my compassion. Despite my inability to determine a viable course of action, I resolved, at the very least, to ascertain his current condition, hopeful that being present would provide insights aligned with my purpose. Without delay, I made my way to the village of Newtown and arrived at the prison. As I approached the door, I inquired after my father. "'You must be looking for Sawney Slaught,' the keeper replied. "'Poor man. He came in here in a state of madness and has been a burden on me ever since.' After lingering for some time, he finally passed away a week ago after drinking his last pint. The news shocked me deeply. It took me some time to gather my thoughts and realize that, in the end, this was not an unfortunate event. The keeper did not know my relation to the deceased and proceeded to recount the prisoner's behavior and his final hours. I will not repeat the story, as it serves no purpose to keep the sad memory alive. My father was beyond the reach of my charity or pity and it was my duty to move on and live for my own happiness and that of those around me. I was now alone in the world, with no family or kin to speak of. I knew nothing of my mother's relatives, and they held no claim to friendship or service towards me. 
I was without the benefits that come with having a family, such as protection, advice, or inheritance. I owned nothing that could serve as a memorial to my family, and the places of my childhood and youth were bleak and barren, with no trace of the past. The strangers who now owned the property and residence knew nothing of its former tenants, and had quickly transformed everything inside and out. This knowledge filled me with melancholy, but as I neared the home of my beloved, my heart lightened. Bess, as I affectionately called her, had become dearer to me in my absence. Thoughts of her brought a softness to my heart and tears to my eyes, a mix of pain and pleasure. As I approached Curling's house, I strained my eyes to catch a glimpse of my love in the evening dusk. I had informed her of my visit in a letter, and she eagerly waited for me at the roadside near the gate. As soon as I arrived, she rushed into my arms. However, my sweet friend was not as content as I had hoped. Despite the love and care from the Curlings, she found her situation mournful and dreary. Rural business bored her, and her life felt heavy and monotonous. I dared to criticize her discontent and pointed out the advantages of her situation. "'Where does this dissatisfaction come from?' I asked. "'I cannot say,' she replied. "'I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm always sad and thoughtful. Perhaps I think too much about my poor father and Susan, but that can't be it either. I hardly ever think of them. I think of nobody but you. Instead of doing my work or chatting with Peggy Curling, I prefer to be alone, reading and rereading your letters, or imagining myself in Fanny Morris's place. However, now all that is finished, this visit has made up for everything. I can't help but wonder how I could have ever been sullen or gloomy. I promise to improve my behavior. Yes, I truly will. I intend to remain as happy as I am in this very moment. We spent most of the three days together, with Eliza sharing the events that occurred during my absence and me reciprocating by recounting the incidents that had happened to me. After this, I returned to the city once again. Chapter 26 With great enthusiasm and tireless effort, I embarked upon the pursuit of my life's plan. My chosen path was one of medical study, and I approached it with a modern zeal. Seeking counsel and instruction from a trusted friend, I shadowed him on his professional visits, and acted as his substitute whenever possible. I was pleasantly surprised to find that this application of my time was more enjoyable than I had anticipated. My mind expanded eagerly to receive new ideas, and my curiosity grew in proportion to the knowledge I gained. Every day brought me closer to the realization that I was not an insignificant or worthless being, but rather one destined for greatness, one who might someday claim the gratitude and respect of my fellow men. Yet I was not consumed by my studies alone. I was made for the pleasures of social interaction to love and be loved, to share my heart and thoughts with all those virtuous and amiable individuals whom fate had brought into my life. My greatest joys and most important duties lay in these connections. Among these individuals, Carlton and his sister, Mrs. Wentworth, and Axa Fielding, were my most cherished companions beyond my own family. I corresponded frequently and openly with all of them, but my closest confidant was undoubtedly Axa. She possessed a rare combination of dignity and independence, and a generosity and enlightenment that surpassed my expectations based on her education. She was a cautious and reserved woman, who didn't readily offer her trust or affection. She required proof of a person's worthiness, before granting them her esteem or confidence. I'm not entirely sure that she adhered to this principle when it came to me. As she once pointed out, my manners were unlike any she had ever seen before. I disregarded conventional rules of behavior, making it difficult for anyone to relate to me. People were left with no choice but to either accept my offer of friendship and trust immediately, or reject it entirely. I was completely unaware of this peculiarity in my behavior. I didn't consider a person's character when deciding whether or not to confide in them. I had no qualms about sharing my thoughts and feelings with anyone who would listen. I was always ready to lend an ear to anyone who needed it. I extended my sympathy and kindness to everyone without expecting anything in return, but I expected the same treatment from others. Axa Fielding's face revealed a mind that was deserving of love and understanding, in my opinion. The moment I captured her attention, I told her as much. I divulged the story of my family, my beliefs about what was right and wrong, my fears and my desires. I spoke with sincerity and fervor, using gestures and expressions that bared my soul. Her maturity, calmness, and wisdom allowed me to behave towards her with childlike affection, 
and I often referred to her as Mama. I spoke at length about my country girl, describing her appearance and personality, recounting our conversations, and detailing my plans to help her become wise, good, and happy. My friend listened to me with rapt attention during these moments. I showed her the letters I had received, and offered her the opportunity to read my drafted responses before they were sealed and sent. During these moments, she would alternately gaze at my face and then avert her eyes. A subtle blush would appear on her cheeks, and her eyes held a deeper significance than usual. These are my thoughts, I said once. Now what do you think? Think, she replied emphatically, turning slightly away, that you are the most peculiar of human beings. But tell me, I continued, pursuing her eyes that avoided mine, am I right? Would you do the same? Can you help me in nurturing my beloved girl? I wish you knew this enchanting little creature, how her heart would overflow with affection and gratitude towards you. She should be like your daughter. No, you are too close in age for that. A sister, an elder sister to her you should be. In that role all relationships would be encompassed. You would be fond sisters, and I would be the fond brother to both of you. As I spoke, my eyes welled with tears. Indeed, in such matters I am like any other woman. My friend was deeply moved struggling momentarily before bursting into tears. "'Good heavens!' I exclaimed. "'What troubles you? Are you feeling unwell?' She displayed a perplexing mixture of emotions, swiftly regaining composure. "'It was foolish of me to be so affected. Something troubled me, I suppose, but it has passed. But come, you need some additional lines to complete the description of the boa in La Capide. "'True, and I have twenty spare minutes. Poor Franks is quite ill, but we cannot visit him until nine. Let's read until then. In this way, my time passed on the wings of both pleasure and self-improvement, occasionally tinged with darker shades. My heart would sometimes betray itself with sighs, particularly when my thoughts turned to poor Eliza, measuring the distance that separated us. The distance between us was too great, I thought to myself. Whenever I found myself in such a state, I sought comfort in the company of Mrs. Fielding. Her music, her conversation or even a book she asked me to read to her always helped ease my troubled mind. On one particular evening, as I was preparing to visit her, I received a letter from my beloved Bess. It read, To A. Slot, Curlings, May 6, 1794. Where is the letter you promised me? Martin, you torment me more than I deserve, more than I could ever do to you. You are cruel to me. I must say it, even if it offends you. I must write even though you don't deserve it, and even though I fear I'm not in the best mood for writing. I should probably go to my chamber and weep. Weep at your unkindness, I was going to say. But maybe it's just forgetfulness. And yet, what could be more unkind than forgetfulness? I'm certain I have never forgotten about you. Sleep, which makes all other images fade away, only brings you closer and makes me see you more clearly. But where could this letter be? Oh, hush, foolish girl. If you say anything like that, Martin will be angry with you. And then, you really would have a reason to cry. He has almost broken your heart with his reproaches more than once before. Your heart is already sore and weak. Any new reproaches would surely break it completely. I will be satisfied. I will be as good a housewife and dairy woman as Peggy Curling and sing as merrily. Why not? I am young, innocent, and healthy. Unfortunately, Peggy has reason to be merry. She has a father, mother, and brothers. But I have none and the one who was all of those things and more to me has forgotten about me. But maybe there's some accident that's preventing him from writing. Maybe Oliver had left the market earlier than usual, or perhaps you had mistaken the house. Alternatively, some unfortunate soul might have suddenly fallen ill, and you were busy tending to their needs, wiping the sweat from their brow and rubbing their cold limbs. Such things happen quite often to people in your line of work, don't they, Martin? That may be why you haven't written. If that's the case... Then should I really be upset about your silence? Of course not. At a time like this, poor Bess could easily be forgotten, and she wouldn't deserve your love if she couldn't understand that. Oh, I hope that's all it is. My hand is trembling so badly that I can hardly write. My fears are making everything seem worse than it actually is. But I can't allow myself to think like that. If it turns out that you're the one who's sick, Martin, what will become of me? I should be the one taking care of you, not the other way around. I'll be there for you through sickness and health. I'll comfort you and help you in any way I can. Why would you deprive yourself of such a loving companion and helper? 
dear Martin. Please reconsider. Let me leave this dreary place and come to you. I'll endure anything just to be by your side, even if it's only for a few minutes a day. I'll stay in the dirtiest alley or the darkest cellar if that's what it takes. I will consider it a palace if I can see you now and then. Don't say no. Don't argue with me, since you're so fond of arguing. I'm determined to have your agreement. However, as much as I enjoy your company, I wouldn't ask if I thought it was improper. You claim it is, and you speak about it in a way I don't understand. You refuse for my sake, you tell me. But please comply for my sake. Your pen can't teach me like your voice can. You write me long letters and tell me a great deal. But my spirit droops when I recall your voice and appearance. And think about how long it will be until I see and hear you again. I don't have the energy to think about the words and paper in front of me. My eyes and thoughts drift far away. I consider how many questions I could ask you. How many doubts you could clear up if you were within earshot. If only you were near me, but I can't ask them here. I'm not good with the pen, and somehow I can only write about myself or you. By the time I've said all this, my fingers are tired, and when I try to tell you how this poem or that story has moved me, I'm at a loss for words. I'm confused and disoriented. It's not like when we talk to each other. With your arm around me and your beautiful face close to mine, I can chatter on indefinitely. Then my heart spills out of my lips. After hours like this, it seems like there are still a thousand things to say. Then I can tell you what the book has told me. I can recite countless verses by heart, even if I've only heard them once. But that's only because you read them to me. Sadly, there's no one here to answer my questions. They don't care for books and think reading is a waste of time. Even Peggy, who you say has a naturally strong mind, wonders how I can find enjoyment in a book. She playfully teases me to put it down, but I don't mind. I enjoy reading especially since you told me that no one could earn your love without a love for books. However, I don't read as eagerly or comprehensively as I used to when my mind was carefree and always curious. Have you noticed how much I've changed? I used to be light-hearted, full of joy and wit, but now I'm as serious as an old tabby cat, though not nearly as wise. Tabby had enough sense to stay away from the fire, but I seem to lack that kind of wisdom. It seems as though I'll never find happiness again. There are too many reasons for everything— too much looking forward. Martin, do you think that sometimes men are too wise to be happy? I'm so serious now that I can't even crack a smile, even when Peggy tries to make me laugh all day. But I know why I'm like this. It's no surprise that after losing my father and sister, being thrown into the world penniless and alone, and now being forgotten by you, I can't find happiness. I doubt I'll ever smile again, at least not while I'm here. If someone were to allow me to live close to them... Near them, the mere sight of their entrance or the sound of their voice asking for me might bring a smile to my face. Even the thought of it now produces a smile, although I hope it's not followed so quickly by tears. They say women are born to face trouble, and tears are given to them for relief. It's all very true. Will you grant me my wish? If Oliver doesn't bring back good news, if he doesn't bring a letter from you, or if your letter still refuses my request, I don't know what might happen. Please consent if you love your poor girl. Uh, chapter 27 Upon reading the letter, a sense of melancholy overcame me, but I refused to let it deter me from my planned visit. Despite the lively and whimsical music my friend played, it failed to lift my spirits. My friend noticed my somber demeanor and probed for an explanation. I confessed that the letter I had just received had cast a shadow over me, and she kindly offered to read it. Meanwhile, I studied her face, for there is no book I enjoy more than the expressions of women, which often convey deeper and more nuanced meanings than the rigid countenances of men. My friend read the letter with evident emotion and remained deep in thought afterward. Eventually she spoke again, remarking on Eliza's eagerness to see me. I shared her sentiment, but detected a hint of confusion in her expression. Upon perceiving her solemn demeanor, I inquired, "'What has caused you to be so grave?' A slight unease appeared in her countenance, as if she wished to conceal her solemnity. "'There it is again,' I remarked. "'New signs of worry on your face, my dear mother, regarding something that you refuse to discuss. However, I have noticed this before, and it has piqued my curiosity. It only happens when my Bess is mentioned. It must be related to her, but I cannot fathom what it might be. Why does her name in particular make you pensive, 
troubled and melancholic. I must know the reason. I fear that you do not share my admiration for this girl and are unwilling to reveal your thoughts. At this point, she had regained her usual composure and without acknowledging my observations about her appearance, replied, If you both agree, why doesn't she leave the country? I believe that is not possible, I responded. Mrs. Stevens claims it would be dishonorable. I am not well versed in etiquette and must therefore rely on those who are. But if only I were truly her father or brother, then all obstacles would be removed. Do you genuinely wish for that? she inquired. Well, no. It would be more logical to desire that society would allow me to act as a father or brother without the actual kinship. Is that the only role you wish to play in this girl's life? she asked. Undoubtedly. The only role, I confirmed. You surprise me. Have you not confessed your love for her? she questioned. I do love her. Nothing on earth is more precious to me than my Bess, I replied. But love comes in various forms. Her father loved her too, she counted. Less than I do. He was a good man, but not particularly emotional. Furthermore, he had another daughter, and they shared his love between them. Bess, on the other hand, has no sister to share my affection. Calamity has become dear to me, and I am now her sole comfort, support, and hope. I cannot fathom any reason that would make me abandon her. My friend let out a sigh, and I asked her why. She responded, It is clear that she relies on you for happiness. I know that, I said. But why the sigh? It's because she depends on you for everything, she said. I understand what you're saying, I replied. You're telling me that I am not capable of supporting her. I know that, but it's not right to give up hope. I am young, healthy, and full of life. I should not despair about living for her and myself. But you're sighing again, and it's hard to stay positive when you do that. Please tell me what you mean. You already know the reason, she said. She thinks that you are the key to her happiness but I'm afraid that she's mistaken. Mistaken? I asked. Please explain. You claim to love her, she said. But why not marry her? Marry her? I exclaimed. She's only fifteen and I am destitute. How can I possibly do that? Fifteen is a suitable age for marriage, she countered. Besides, you two could live together more easily than apart. She is not materialistic, and she has been raised to be simple and content. As for your financial situation... That can be resolved. But are those really all your objections? I object to her youth, I said, because her mind is not yet fully developed. She lacks the maturity and intelligence that ten more years of life might give her. You are very cautious, she said. Are you willing to wait ten years for a wife? Does that necessarily follow? I asked. Why must I wait for Bess to be qualified for wedlock? Martin questioned, his tone laced with frustration. I assumed you loved her, replied his friend. I do love her, but my love is content with ensuring her happiness, much like a father or brother would. The desire for marriage is sudden. It may grow in a few years or even half a year, but I do not expect it, Martin explained. So, you have no intention of marrying this girl? Not until I feel that love again. It may come in five or eight years, or it may be sparked by someone else before then, Martin responded. His friend was puzzled by his words. I thought you loved best with a marriage-seeking passion. I did, but that was at a time when it was not proper to marry her. Since then, I have been fortunate enough to be in the company of women who are far superior to Eliza Hadwin. I cannot imagine ever loving her again, Martin explained. She was skeptical. You once praised her natural endowments and her pure and honest character. You described her as a sweet and tender angel of loveliness. All of that is true. Bess is delicately beautiful, and her young mind is sharp and steadfast. But she is not the woman I want to call my wife, Martin said firmly. My beloved, my confidant, my guide, my children's caretaker, must be a different being, I said. But what qualities does Bess desire in this ideal person? Everything, I replied. Age, intelligence, skills, appearance, features, complexion, all must differ from this girl's. And what kind of attributes should this person possess, she asked. I cannot put it into words, but I can feel it the person I will worship. It sounds strange, but I believe that my love for my wife will be more like worship than anything else. I will only love someone who fits my ideal image, and that person deserves, or almost deserves, worship. But this person must be an exact replica of you, my dear mother. I spoke with great sincerity, and my eyes and manner conveyed my earnestness. 
Perhaps my words were too emphatic because she blushed and jumped. But her discomfort was quickly forgotten as she said, Poor Bess, this will be sad news for her. God forbid, I exclaimed. What importance do my thoughts hold for her? You are a strange one, she replied. You know that her gentle heart is filled with love. Look at her beautiful letter. Doesn't her sweet innocence captivate you? I am captivated and love the sweet girl immensely, I said. But my love for her is somehow different from the passion that another person will bring. She is not a stranger to my thoughts. I will share every thought with her over and over again. I have no doubt that I can make her happy without sacrificing my own happiness. Would marrying her mean sacrificing your happiness? She asked. Not completely or forever, I believe. I enjoy her company and her absence for a long time is unbearable. I cannot express the joy I feel when I see and hear her. Her vivacious features were a joy to behold, and her playful pleasures were always a delight to share. Holding her in my arms, I could listen to her prattle for hours on end, her words always musically voluble, sweetly tender, or artlessly intelligent. You might say this is the dearest privilege of marriage, and I would agree. It is a privilege that I hold dear, and yet my heart is burdened by the thought of another image that comes unbidden to my mind. This other image is one that I can never possess, and it fills me with a sense of longing that is almost unbearable at times. But perhaps this image need not trouble me so much. I could try to prolong the intervals between its appearances and focus instead on the happiness of my beloved girl. I could remind myself that remaining unmarried would not necessarily guarantee me the other good that I seek. My friend interrupted my thoughts. Your reflections, she said, are as much a reason for you to marry as they are to reconcile you to a marriage already contracted. I had to admit that she was right. I had no hope of ever attaining the happiness that I had imagined. Such happiness was not meant for mortals and certainly not for me. My friend spoke up again, her voice timid. Your diffidence is rare, but your character is unique. You possess everything yet claim nothing. That is your picture in a nutshell. I was confused by her words. I don't understand, I said. Do you think I will ever be happy in the way that I have imagined? Do you think I will ever find someone like you? If you don't, she replied, you will be unlucky indeed. Your Bess is far superior to me in every way, both in looks and in intellect. But that, I said with sudden passion, is not the point. I desire someone who is your very counterpart, neither worse nor better, and not different in any way. The same form, features, and hues, the same captivating voice, and above all, the same manner of thinking and conversing. In thought, word, and action, in gesture, gaze, and appearance, that extraordinary and precious person whom I will love must bear your resemblance. Enough with these comparisons, she interrupted hastily. Let us return to the country girl, your Bess. You once wished me to treat her as my sister. Do you understand the responsibilities of being a sister? They require no more kindness or affection than you already feel for my Bess. Aren't you already her sister? I should have been. I should have been proud to have the relationship you attribute to me. But I haven't fulfilled any of its duties. I'm ashamed to admit the coldness and obstinacy of my heart. Despite having the means to bring happiness to others, I have been thoughtless and inactive to a surprising degree. Perhaps, however, it is not too late. Are you still willing to grant me all the rights of an elder sister over this girl? And do you think she will agree? Certainly she will. She already has. In that case, the first act of sisterhood will be to remove her from the countryside, away from those who have shown her kindness without any natural obligation whose manners and characters differ from her own, and with whom no improvement can be expected. We will bring her back to her sister's home and embrace, provide for her well-being and education, and safeguard her happiness. I refuse to be merely a nominal sister. I will not accept half-hearted sisterhood. I will have all the rights that come with that relationship, or none at all. You have some claims on her, but I must be the one to judge as the elder sister. I have lost all other family members, and must take on the roles of father, mother, and brother. She has reached an age where staying in a cold and unfriendly environment will stunt her growth and ruin her potential. We must move her to a better place where she can thrive. I have neglected her for too long, so I will take her under my wing from now on. And now that she is fully mine, I will charge you with bringing her to me. I grant you this as a favor. Will you go? I will go. I will fly. I will reach Curling's Gate by dawn and have her in my arms by noon, but before I go, 
Can I show my gratitude in some way? I was overcome with joy and didn't know what I was doing. I meant to kneel before her, but instead I hugged her tightly and kissed her passionately. I left the room and the house, stopping briefly at Stevens's to inform the servant that I wouldn't be back until the next day. My heart was light, and my spirits were high despite the cold and the long journey. I could have ridden, but I couldn't bear any delay, not even the time it would take to find and prepare a horse. I could have saved myself some fatigue and time, but my mind was too chaotic for planning and foresight. I only saw the image of my beloved, whose happiness I would bring with my news. The journey was longer than I had imagined. I arrived at Curling's an hour after sunrise, after traveling a full thirty-five miles. As I hurried up the green lane leading to the house, I caught sight of Bess passing through a covered passage between the dwelling and kitchen. Our eyes met, and she stopped and held up her hands, then ran into my arms. "'What's wrong, my dear? Why are you catching your breath? Why are you sobbing? Look at me, my love. It's Martin, the one who has treated you with forgetfulness, neglect, and cruelty.' "'Oh, please don't,' she replied, hiding her face with her hand. One more reproach added to my own will kill me. That foolish, wicked letter. I could kick myself for writing it. But, I said, I'll kiss your fingers, and I put them to my lips. They've told me what my girl wants. They've allowed me to fulfill her wishes. I've come to take you to town this very moment. Lord bless me, Martin, she said, lost in sweet confusion, her cheeks always glowing, now even more deeply. I didn't mean, I meant only, I'll stay here. I'd rather stay... It pains me to hear that, I said earnestly. I thought I was working for our mutual happiness. It pains you. Don't say that. I wouldn't want to hurt you for the world. But truly, it's too soon. A girl like me isn't yet ready to live in your city. She buried her glowing face in my chest once again. Such sweet innocence and consciousness filled my mind as I pondered Axe's conjectures. I hoped that they would prove false, for my intentions were misunderstood. I did not plan to bring my companion to town for any nefarious purpose, but rather to place her with a dear friend, Axa Fielding, whom she already knew so well. There, we could enjoy each other's company without interruption or restraint. I explained this plan to her and the consequences that would follow. She was overjoyed and grateful, readily agreeing to the scheme. Preparations for departure were made quickly and easily. I hired a carriage from a local farmer and kept my promise by delivering the timid girl to her new sister by noon that same day. She was welcomed with open arms by Mrs. Fielding and all my friends, who showed her the utmost tenderness. Under the gentle guidance of her new mother figure, my companion's confidence was restored, and her affectionate heart was allowed to pour forth its emotions. She eagerly engaged in every plan for her improvement, and made remarkable progress in a short amount of time. Though she possessed some of the graces that come with a polished education and social interaction, her natural refinement and sagacity of mind were what truly shone through. With the guidance of her new family, she quickly adapted to her new surroundings, and soon her unassuming country girl nature was all that remained. As for me, I was often found at my pen, writing and observing the world around me. I must know the fruit of all this toil and meditation. I am determined to make the acquaintance of Haller and Linnaeus, it is important that one's friends are ours. Love has made many a patient, and let me see if it cannot make a physician in my case. But first, what is all this writing about? Mrs. Wentworth has given me a task, not disagreeable, but one that I might have declined had it not been for the absence of my Bess and her mother. I have told her about my adventures before, but she is not satisfied. She wants a written narrative for some undisclosed purpose. Luckily, my friend Stevens has saved me more than half the trouble. He has compiled much of my history with his own hand. It is wearisome, but he says that my singular adventures and destiny should not be abandoned to forgetfulness. Besides, he suspected that it might be necessary for the safety of my reputation and life due to my connection with Welbeck. Time has annihilated that danger, and all enmities and suspicions are buried with that ill-fated wretch. Wortley has been won by my behavior and he now confides in my integrity. I am glad that the task was performed because it has saved me a world of writing. I only had to take up the broken thread and bring it down to the period of my present happiness, which was done just as you tripped along the entry this morning. Off to bed, my friend. It's late, and this fragile body is not as equipped to handle exhaustion as a young person who has spent their days in the fields and pastures might have been. 
But before I retire for the night, allow me to take these sheets with me. I am determined to read them and see if you've told the whole truth. By all means do so. But remember, Mrs. Wentworth requested that I write as if it were not meant for her eyes, but for those who have no previous knowledge of her or myself. It was an odd request, and I cannot fathom what she meant by it. But she always has a good reason for her actions, and I have complied. Now, my dear, please leave and bid me farewell. My quill, take flight. Do not wait for my direction. With my master's spirit reinvigorated, I feel a surge of energy, a joyous thrill that lifts me from the earth. I must rein in this upward pull, this forward momentum that threatens to carry me away. But there are moments like this one when words fail me. I have exhausted myself trying to find peace, to accept rest on a couch or lose myself in a book, anything to distract my heart from the pounding within. Let me see. They say it is Monday night. Only three more days until what? If I am this restless today, if my heart races until it can barely be contained within my chest, what will tomorrow bring? What about the next day? As the hours tick by, as the sun sets, as my hand touches hers in a sign of love and unity, what then? I must quell these tumultuous emotions. Otherwise they will render me helpless. My strength is slowly dwindling, drained away by the thought of her. It's hard to believe that it's only been three months since I laid eyes on her, and three weeks since we pledged our love to each other. Now, only three days stand between us and our future together. The anticipation is almost too much to bear. I must find a way to calm myself, to find refuge from these excruciating feelings. All extremes are agonizing, and this joy is too big for my narrow existence. I must push it out, lock it away for a time, or risk bursting apart at the seams. The pen is my solace, my pacifier. It forces me to focus on one path, to quiet my wandering mind. It has been my friend for as long as I can remember, blunting my vexations, hushing my passions, turning my peevishness to soothing and my revenge to pity. It may befriend me now, tempering my impetuous wishes, lulling my intoxication, and rendering my happiness supportable. Already my blood flows less rapidly, my thoughts less disorderly, but I must continue at the pen, for fear of relapsing into my former state. I must look back upon the steps that led me here, recounting the preliminaries of my love for Axa Fielding. To describe her is to do her an injustice, for the term lovely does not begin to capture her true beauty. Despite her short stature and dark, almost sallow complexion, she is the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. Her piercing black eyes have a cast that defies explanation, but it is her history that truly accounts for the zeal, almost to idolatry, with which I regard her. And so I must recount it here in brief, to truly capture the essence of Axa Fielding. The shining beauty of her spirit is not diminished by any superficial flaws in her appearance. Her heart and intellect far outweigh any personal imperfections, and this is the secret of her captivating power over those who listen to her or behold her. Her speech is always musical, not just when she sings, and her eloquence flows richly and effortlessly, regardless of the topic at hand. I had pledged my love and loyalty to her long before I learned about her past, which I only picked up on through casual remarks or gossip from others. I knew she was English by birth, and had only been in America for a year and a half, and that she was still in the prime of her youth at twenty-five years old. I also knew she had been married, but whether the union ended in death or divorce remained a mystery to me. What I did know was that she possessed a considerable and impressive fortune, though the exact amount and other details were not revealed until later on in our acquaintance. One evening, while she spoke passionately about the influence of birth in Great Britain, I found myself transfixed by her gaze. There was something familiar about the way her eyes looked, and it suddenly dawned on me that they held a secret. Without thinking, I blurted out, My dear lady, your eyes have just revealed something to me. They spoke to me in a way, and I am astonished by the clarity of their message. Naturally, she was curious and asked me to elaborate, but I hesitated, unsure if I had imagined the whole thing. Perhaps I was mistaken, I said, hoping to leave it at that. Perhaps I was mistaken or had misheard, but I swear upon my deathbed that I heard them say you were a Jew. Her face immediately clouded with sadness and embarrassment. She covered her eyes with her hand and began to weep. I was taken aback by her reaction and begged for her forgiveness for causing her distress. After a moment, she composed herself and spoke. You have done nothing wrong, Martin. 
Your assumption was natural and understandable. The word Jew carries with it a great deal of pain and suffering which time cannot heal. The less I dwell on the past, the more peace I will have. I wanted you to only know me for who I am now, and not to bring up memories that will do no good. I realize now that it was foolish of me to try and keep you in the dark. I will tell you everything that has happened to me so that your curiosity can be satisfied, and we can move forward without any secrets. My father was indeed a Jew, and a wealthy one at that. He was born in Portugal but came to London as a young boy. Despite the stereotypes that surround the Jewish community, my father was a good man. He was frugal without being cheap, and he conducted his business with honesty and fairness. This was well known throughout the community. I was an only child and the favorite of my parents, who raised me in a very liberal manner. My education was purely English, learning the same things and from the same teachers as my neighbors. Aside from attending their church, reciting their creed, and sharing the same food, I saw no difference between them and myself. As a result, I became somewhat indifferent to religion, as it was never enforced upon me. No effort was made to instill me with scruples or antipathies, and they never stood as a barrier to my upbringing. Though they were often thought upon, they were vague and easily forgotten. This lack of vigilance allowed my heart to be too easily swayed by the impressions of others. My society was wholly English, and my youth, education and father's wealth made me an object of much attention. The same factors that lulled my own watchfulness also affected others. It is too late to regret or praise this negligence, but it is certain that my destiny, an unhappy one, was sealed by it. The result of this negligence was a passion for someone who reciprocated it. He was almost as young as I was, only sixteen, and knew as little as I did about the obstacles that our different backgrounds would create. His father, Sir Ralph Fielding, was nobly born, high in office, and splendidly allied, making it unlikely that he would consent to his eldest son marrying the daughter of an alien, a Portuguese and a Jew. However, these impediments were not seen by my ignorance, and were disregarded by the youth's passion. Strangely enough, the outcome that common sense would have predicted did not occur. Sir Ralph had a large and growing family, but his inheritance was meagre, and the income from his positions barely sustained them. The young man was headstrong and impulsive, likely to disregard his family's wishes. However, the father agreed to the marriage on one condition, my conversion to the English church. Given my thoughtless youth, upbringing devoid of religious influence, and influenced by the passions of the company I kept, I was not expected to oppose the idea. My fears regarding my father's decision quickly vanished. He loved me too much to oppose my desires in such a significant matter. Since I had no scruples or reluctance, he deemed it unnecessary for himself to be scrupulous on my behalf. With my own heart having abandoned my previous religion, any hesitation about a formal renunciation seemed absurd. These were his stated reasons for agreeing, but time revealed that there were likely other underlying reasons rooted in his concern for my happiness. If known, these reasons would have further strengthened the reluctance of my lover's family. The marriage commenced with the happiest omens. My husband's numerous relatives warmly welcomed me into their fold. My father's affection remained unwavering despite the change, and the humiliations I had previously endured were now a thing of the past. As a mother, every bond was further fortified within a year. It was necessary for me to experience a season of happiness in order to endure the sorrowful reversals that followed. One disaster after another befell me, each one heavier than the last, and they came so quickly that I scarcely had time to catch my breath. Just as I had left my room, feeling better than I had in ages, and excited to embrace the new and precious gift I had received, I received the most melancholy news. I was staying in the countryside at my father-in-law's estate when the messenger arrived. The tale he told was shocking, and he told it abruptly and without pity. I had already mentioned to you my father's passing, but the manner of his death, my friend, was truly horrific. He had been a peaceful, respected old man, even though my mother had noticed signs of distress for some time. No one could have suspected him capable of such a thing, for he had been so careful with his affairs that no one suspected the extent of the damage misfortune had wrought. As you can imagine, I loved my father dearly, and the news of his death was a terrible blow. I could never have anticipated the cause of his despair, and he had seen his ruin coming even before my marriage. For the sake of his daughter and wife, 
He had decided to postpone his downfall for as long as possible. But he had also made up his mind not to survive the day he became destitute. His desperate act had been premeditated with great care. His true financial situation was revealed only after his death. The collapse of major mercantile houses in Frankfurt and Liège had been the cause of his ruin. And so, my future was suddenly plunged into darkness. The wealth that had no doubt been the main reason my husband's family had approved of our match was now replaced by poverty. Having been brought up in a life of extravagance and opulence, I was acutely aware that my wealth was the only thing preventing me from being scorned by the haughty and prejudiced individuals of society. It was also my primary claim to the status that I had attained, which I took great pleasure in, as it allowed me to bestow significant favours upon my spouse. Therefore, what could be more devastating than the misfortune that had befallen me? The violent death of my father had already caused me great sorrow, and now this added bitterness to my grief. However, the loss of my riches did not prove to be my ultimate downfall. Although it did bruise my pride, it was not the worst of my afflictions. In fact, one could argue that it was not even a calamity, as it provided an opportunity to test my husband's love. Thankfully, the outcome of this trial was favorable, as my misfortune only served to increase the affection that others had for me due to the positive qualities of my character. Sir Ralph had always been fond of me, but now his paternal love seemed to be even more intense. Unfortunately, new events made this consolation all the more necessary. My poor mother. She had been closer to the tragic incident when it occurred, and had no surviving family member to ease her sorrow. Additionally, she had become more reliant upon wealth due to her long-standing habits. At first her grief manifested as a silent melancholy, causing her to lose interest in everything that once brought her joy. Even the sweet melodies that used to fill her ears, particularly when her beloved child sang them, no longer brought any pleasure. I would sit beside her with tears streaming down my face, trying to capture her attention and lift her spirits. But I must not dwell on these memories. However, this distress was nothing compared to what was to come. The mute and motionless frenzy that had overtaken my mother was soon replaced by fits of mania, causing her to become talkative and violent. She required constant supervision and restraint, and even physical force in some instances. Why have you brought me back to these painful memories? Please excuse me for now. I will continue the rest of the story some other time, perhaps tomorrow, she said. The next day arrived, and she resumed her narrative. Let me bring my mournful tale to a close, she began and I implore you never to do anything that would revive it again. Despite the deep despair caused by these calamities, I was not devoid of some joy. My husband and child were beautiful and loving. Their affection and well-being brought me solace, and I could have continued to find peace if it weren't for... But why should I reopen wounds that time has only partially healed? However, this story must be told to you at some point, and the sooner it is shared and forgotten, the better. Unfortunate circumstances led me to associate with a woman well-known in idle and dissipated circles. I was aware of her character, and there was nothing in her appearance or demeanor to dispel unfavorable impressions. I did not seek her company. In fact, I avoided it as unpleasant and disreputable. However, she was relentless and imposed herself upon me. She became a frequent guest without invitation, involved herself in my affairs, rendered me many acts of kindness, and eventually, despite my resistance, gained my sympathy and gratitude. I believed, foolishly, that there was no one in the world I had less reason to fear than Mrs. Waring. Her character did not raise any concerns for my own safety. She was over forty, lacking grace or beauty, garishly dressed, trying to conceal the signs of aging but only making them more noticeable. She was the mother of a large family with limited education, always careful to maintain appearances, and kept a distance from my husband and me enduring rather than desiring her company. What could I possibly fear from someone like her? However, the woman possessed extraordinary cunning. She had inexhaustible patience, undetectable vigilance, and employed the most subtle and artful insinuations. She gradually insinuated herself into my affections through unparalleled perseverance in feigned kindness, by building a sense of trust, by glossing over her past misdeeds with artful excuses, and by pretending remorse and self-reproach. Never were stratagems so intricate and dissimulation so profound. Yet astonishingly, this woman managed to seduce my husband. He was young, generous, ambitious, 
intolerant of disrespect and reproach, and certainly not indifferent. Before this fatal involvement, he had not been indifferent to his wife and child, but that was the reality. I witnessed his discontent, his inner struggles. I heard him curse this woman, and even more intensely because of my attempts, unaware of her manipulations, to reconcile them, to dispel what seemed to be baseless anger or aversion towards her. Little did I suspect the true nature of the conflict within his heart, torn between a newfound passion and the demands of pride, conscience, and humanity. It was a conflict between the claims of his child and his wife, a wife already burdened by affliction, who had placed all remaining happiness on the strength of his virtue and the continuity of his love. At the very moment he planned to flee, I was filled with fear at the imminent arrival of an event that demanded a husband's unwavering support and encouraging love. Good heavens! To what misfortunes are some of your creatures subjected? Resignation to your decree, even in the most cruel distress, was an arduous task indeed. And then he was gone. He offered a plausible excuse, citing an unavoidable commitment in Hamburg. How could I reproach or object? The story seemed so convincing. The fate of a friend supposedly depended on his timely departure. However, the falseness of his tale soon became apparent. He had left accompanied by his detested paramour. Although my vigilance was easily deceived, others were not so easily fooled. A creditor, holding his bond for three thousand pounds, pursued and apprehended him in Harwich. He was thrown into prison, but the woman, to her credit, did not abandon him. She found lodging near his place of confinement and visited him daily. If it were not for her actions and my own circumstances, I would have taken on that responsibility. Indignation and grief hastened the painful crisis within me. I did not weep that the second child of this unfortunate union would never see the light of day. My tears flowed solely because this hour of agony was not the last for its unfortunate mother. I did not feel anger. My heart was filled only with compassion for Fielding. I longed to have him back in my arms and in the embrace of virtue. I wrote to him, invoking our past joys, pleading with him to return. I vowed gratitude for his newfound affection and asked only for the reward of seeing him restored to his family, to liberty, and to his reputation. But no, Fielding possessed a good yet proud heart. He viewed his mistake with remorse, self-loathing, and the fatal belief that it could never be rectified. Shame compelled him to resist all my reasoning and persuasion. In the tumult of his emotions, he made solemn vows that, once he regained his freedom, he would renounce his country and his family forever. He bore the burden of his new attachment with indignation, but he struggled in vain to break free. Her behavior, always yielding, adoring, and supplicative, kept him ensnared. Despite being reproached, rejected, and banished from his presence, she refused to leave him. Through new efforts and artifices, she soothed, appeased, and regained his affection. What my entreaties were unable to accomplish, his father could not hope to achieve, his father offered to release him from prison, and the creditor offered to cancel the debt if he returned to me. However, he adamantly refused this condition. All of his relatives, including his childhood best friend, begged him to comply with the conditions, but his pride and fear of my justified criticisms, as well as the persuasions and reasoning of his new companion, whose sacrifices for his sake had been significant, were obstacles that could not be overcome. I never intended to impose these conditions, I simply waited until I could arrange enough funds to pay off his debts and allow him to fulfill his promise. If I had not done so, my claims to his affection would have been empty. I could not have allowed my husband to remain in prison for even a moment when I had the means to deliver him. The only remaining portion of my father's vast fortune was a jointure of one thousand pounds per year, which was settled on my mother and then on me after her death. My mother's helpless state allowed me to control this revenue. With this money, I was able to purchase my husband's debt and secure his release from prison without the knowledge of my father-in-law or husband. He immediately left for France with his mistress. After recovering from the shock of this tragedy, I moved in with my mother. Although her assets were enough for a comfortable living, it was similar to poverty for us, who were accustomed to a different lifestyle. I often reflected on my father's memory, my mother's worsening condition, the recent misfortune, and my son's constant smiles which brought some comfort during my loneliness. I dedicated all of my time to my mother's needs and my child's education. 
Despite my admiration for Fielding's talents and my belief in his noble and generous spirit, I hoped that time and reflection would break the spell that bound him. For a while I kept these thoughts to myself. Upon leaving England, Fielding severed all ties with his homeland. He bid farewell to the woman he was with in Rouen, leaving no trace for her to follow him, despite her desire to do so. Sadly, she passed away in Switzerland a year later. As for myself, I could not help but ponder the fate of my dear husband. His father had disowned him and had no interest in his welfare. My own son had taken his place within the family, leaving Fielding with no support from his kin. For three agonizing years, we heard nothing of his whereabouts. We did not know if he was alive or dead. Then, an English traveler, who had taken a less-traveled route through Italy, stumbled upon Fielding in a small town in Venaissin. He had become completely French in his mannerisms, habits, and language. At first he was hesitant to be recognized by his former acquaintance, but as they grew more comfortable with each other, he revealed many details about his present life. He had made himself indispensable to a local lord and had been living with him in his chateau as a brother. France had become his new home, and he had even adopted his patron's name, Perrin, as his own. He had thrown himself into the pleasures of country life and study, trying to make up for all that he had lost. He avoided any questions about me with great care. However, when his friend mentioned my name and inquired about my well-being, as well as that of his son, he showed great emotion and even agreed to let me know his situation. This news had a profound effect on me. It rekindled my hopes of bringing him back to me. I wrote a heartfelt letter to him, pouring out all my emotions. His reply, however, contained his unwavering commitment to his previous decision. I wrote two more letters, offering to follow him to his place of exile, but my efforts were in vain. He repeatedly denied his role as my husband, freeing me from any obligation as his wife. Despite this, his letters were not harsh or contemptuous. They were a strange mix of pathos and indifference, tenderness and determination. These letters gave me hope, but time never brought me any closer to certainty. When the revolution began, Perrin's name appeared among the deputies to the Constituent Assembly for the district in which he lived. He had gained all the rights of a French citizen, and the possibility of his return seemed almost impossible. Any hope I had left was extinguished when he married Marguerite Delmont, a wealthy and talented young woman from Avignon. This period of uncertainty came to an end, leaving me in a state of anguish similar to that of our initial separation. The death of my mother only added to my sorrow. However, this event freed me from the previous constraints on my movements, and I decided to travel to America. My son had reached the age of eight, and my father was insisting on taking over his education. Despite my friend's protests, I agreed to send him to a distant school. Another tie was broken, and I was determined to cross the ocean and start anew. It may have seemed like a desperate plan, but I was resolute. My friends urged me to reconsider, but I refused. During my voyage I was terrified by the unfamiliar dangers that surrounded me. I regretted my decision, but now I am glad I persevered. I have been thrown into a society so different from my own, and have been forced to use all of my ingenuity and fortitude. My mind has been distracted from my past sorrows, and there are even moments when I feel happy and content. It is surprising to me how my mind works. It has been eight years since my father's violent death and yet I have had so few moments of peace. So many nights and days have been spent in tears and regret. It is a wonder that I am still alive, considering the many causes of death that I have faced and the slow-consuming malady that plagues me. I have realized that solitude and idleness are the worst enemies of someone in grief. The same monotonous routine can feed the disease, and the effects of emptiness and uniformity can be mistaken for sorrow. That is why I am grateful that I came to America. My relatives have been urging me to return, and until recently, I entertained thoughts of doing so. However, I now believe that I will remain where I am for the remainder of my days. Since my arrival, I have become more of a student than I used to be. I have always loved literature, but it is only recently that I have had a mind at ease to read and benefit from it. I find pleasure in this occupation, which I never expected to find. As you can see, this is how I live. The letters I brought with me secured a warm reception from the esteemed individuals in your country. However, scenes of social gatherings and frivolity held no attraction for me. I quickly withdrew to the seclusion in which you now find me. 
Here, always at leisure and in possession of every noble means of gratification, I hold on to the belief that serene days lie ahead. I mustered the courage to inquire about her latest news regarding her husband. As I mentioned earlier, at the start of the revolution, he became a champion of the people. Through his zeal and efforts, he gained enough importance to be delegated to the National Assembly. In this position, he aligned himself with radical measures until the monarchy was overthrown. Unfortunately, when it was too late for his own safety, he put a halt to his radical pursuits, she replied. And what has become of him since then? I asked. She let out a deep sigh. You were reading a list of the prescribed under Robespierre yesterday. I stopped you. I had good reason to do so. But this topic has become too painful. Let us change it. After some time had passed, I dared to bring up the subject again, and discovered that Fielding, now known by the name Perrin Dalmont, was among the outlawed deputies of the previous year, and had been killed while resisting the officers sent to arrest him. My friend had been informed that his wife, Marguerite Dalmont, whom she believed to be a woman of great merit, had managed to evade persecution and seek refuge somewhere in America. Despite several failed attempts, she was determined to discover the whereabouts of the French woman. Frustrated and at a loss, I offered my services, declaring that I would scour the entire continent from Penobscot to Savannah until she was found. Not a crevice would remain unexplored in my relentless pursuit. Chapter 28 It is not surprising that my heart willingly bestowed all its sympathies on a woman so unfortunate yet deserving. As I shared in her grief, I also rejoiced in the glimpses of happiness that finally appeared in her imagination. I saw her frequently, as often as my obligations allowed, and even more often than I permitted myself to visit anyone else. In this, I was partly selfish. Her conversations provided me with such entertainment and invaluable instruction that I could never get enough of them. Her experiences were so much broader and entirely different from mine, and she possessed an immense ability to recount all she had seen and felt with absolute sincerity and openness. Our conversations were both instructive and delightful, and I can imagine nothing more rewarding than her company. Books, in comparison, felt cold, dry, and frustratingly sparing with their information at times, while excessively verbose at others. They offered no opportunity for questions, further explanations, or the nuances of gestures, looks, cadences, emphasis, and pauses that imbued meaning in conversation. Mrs. Fielding's discourse, on the other hand, was vastly different. It was versatile, adapting to the occasion, responsive to my curiosity, and abundant in the very knowledge I lacked and valued the most, the knowledge of the human heart and the intricate workings of society in a world I had never witnessed. I admit that my motives were partly selfish, but not entirely, as long as I saw that my presence brought pleasure to my friend. While I could not directly contribute to her knowledge or enjoyment, my mere presence seemed to expand her heart, facilitate her expression, and inspire a flow of ideas. These were sources of true pleasure from which she had long been deprived, and her deprivation had heightened her appreciation for them. She lived in great wealth and independence, but used her privileged position primarily to secure command over her own time. She had grown tired and disillusioned with the monotonous and superficial nature of the theatre and ballrooms. Formal visits were endured as mortifications and penances, only highlighting the joys of private and friendly interactions. She loved music, but sought it not in public venues or from mercenary performers. Books also brought her pleasure. As for me, I was pliable in her hands. Without design or effort, I always assumed the form she desired. My own happiness became secondary, while her satisfaction became the primary purpose of my existence. When I was with her, I did not think of myself. I had scarcely an independent or separate existence because my senses were consumed by her presence, and my mind was filled with the ideas that her conversations imparted. I pondered over her expressions and words, and I devoted myself to pursuing any means that my own thoughts or her suggestions offered to benefit her in any way. "'What a fate you have endured!' I exclaimed at the end of one of our conversations. But thankfully, the storm has passed before the age of sensibility has waned." without drying up every source of happiness. You are still young, with all your powers intact, rich in the compassion and esteem of the world, completely independent from the demands and whims of others, and abundantly supplied with the means of usefulness known as money. You have gained wisdom from the experiences that only adversity can provide. 
past hardships and sufferings, if incurred and endured without guilt, when viewed without remorse, become the foundation of present joy. They brighten our dreariest moments with the resounding echoes of well done, and they elevate our pleasures with a deep, ruefully deep contrast, imbuing them with a touch of celestial brilliance. From this moment on, I will cease to weep for you. I will consider you the happiest of women. I will share in your happiness by bearing witness to it, but that will not satisfy me. I must find a way to contribute to it. Tell me how I can serve you. What can I do to make you even happier? I may be lacking in many things, but I possess zeal, and that may count for something. Please tell me what can I do. She looked at me with a sweet and solemn significance. I couldn't discern its exact meaning, but it profoundly affected me. It was a fleeting glance, quickly withdrawn. She did not answer me. You must not remain silent. You must tell me what I can do for you. Until now I have done nothing. All the service has been on your side. Your conversation has been my study, a delightful study, but the benefit has been solely mine. Please tell me how I may show my gratitude to you, I said, trying to hide my apprehension. I had almost done something that I suspected to be unauthorized, but I couldn't explain why. All I felt was reverence and admiration toward her. She reminded me of my lost mother, and I would have embraced her if she were a shade. However, the two beings were not the same, so I restrained myself and only kissed her hand. Please tell me, I repeated. What can I do for you? I enjoy reading to you, and I'm happy when you like my reading. I can also transcribe for you and guide the reins when you go horseback riding. These may be humble tasks, but they are all I can offer as a young man. Nevertheless, I can do more. I can read for several hours a day and write ten times as much as I do now. You remind me of my lost mother. But you're not exactly like her. You're different, and I think you're better. I want to be yours entirely. I'll be restless and uneasy until every action, every thought, every minute benefits you. How? she asked, her eyes avoiding mine and her voice trembling. She seemed about to stand up, but then she sat down again. Have I offended you? I asked. Forgive me if I have been too persistent. She burst into tears and I felt guilty. Please don't cry. I said. Have I caused you pain? No, she replied, wiping her tears. These tears are not for you. They're for me. I cry easily these days, but they're tears of joy. You have a wonderful heart, I said. If you can feel such joy, then you must have felt great pain in the past. But you're not angry with me, are you? You will accept me as your own in everything. Direct me. Prescribe to me. There must be something in which I can be of even greater use to you. Some way in which I can be completely yours, I implored her. Holy mine, she repeated in a stifled voice, rising from her seat. Leave me, Martin. It is too late for you to be here. It was wrong to stay so late. I have been wrong, but how can it be too late? I just arrived. It is still twilight, isn't it? No, it is almost midnight. You have been here for a long four hours, or rather, I should say, short ones. But indeed you must go. What made me so thoughtless of the time? But I will go yet not until you forgive me. I approached her with a confidence and a purpose that, upon reflection, surprised me. But being in her presence, I am not the same person as I am with others. What is the difference, and where does it come from? Her words and looks captivate me. My mind has no space for any other object. But why inquire about the source of the difference? The superiority of her merits and charms over all those I have known surely accounts for my fervor. Indifference, if I were to feel it, would be the only cause for wonder. The hour was indeed too late, and I hastened home. Stevens was waiting for my return with some concern. I apologized for my delay and recounted to him what had transpired. He listened with more than usual interest. When I finished, he said, Slot, you do not seem to be aware of your current situation, based on what you have just told me, as well as what you have shared in the past. One thing seems very clear to me. Pray. Tell me, what is it? Eliza Hadwin, do you wish? Could you bear to see her as another man's wife? Five years from now, I will give you an answer. My answer must be no. I desire only for her to be mine when the time is right. Until then, I wish to guide her as a pupil, protect her as a ward, and cherish her as a sister. The thought of marriage may seem distant, but it is not a barrier to love. Would it not trouble you to see her devoted to another... 
It would trouble me, but only for her sake, not mine. When the time is right, and if she continues on her current path, it is likely that I will love her. But for now, I have no desire to secure her happiness through marriage, though I would do anything to ensure her well-being. Is there no one else that you love? No. There is only one who is more deserving than all others. She is the standard by which I wish to measure my future wife. And who is this model? You know that I can only be referring to Axa Fielding. If you love her qualities so much, why not love her herself? The mere thought of it made my heart race. That is a dangerous thought. I love her as I love God and virtue. To love her in any other way would be madness. So you view loving her as a woman as foolish? For me it would be worse than foolishness. It would be insanity. And why is that? You surprise me with that question. It implies that you doubt my innocence. While I have not entertained such thoughts, the mere suggestion is alarming. I do not doubt your innocence, but I see no harm in asking why you could not love her and seek her hand in marriage. The thought of Axa Fielding as my wife sent my mind into a frenzy. Axa Fielding as my wife? Good heavens! The very idea throws me into an unconquerable tumult. Take care, my friend, I continued in beseeching tones. You may do me more harm than you realize by even entertaining such a thought. That's true, he replied as long as there are so many insurmountable obstacles to your success, so many irreparable objections. For instance, she is six years older than you. That is an advantage. Her age is exactly as it should be. But she has already been a wife and mother. That is also an advantage. She possesses wisdom because of her experiences. Her sensibilities are stronger because they have been tested and refined. Her first marriage was unfortunate. The greater will be her happiness in a second. If her second choice is favorable... Her tenderness and gratitude will be even greater. But she is a foreigner, independent and wealthy, all of which are blessings for herself and for the one to whom she will offer her hand, especially if, like me, he is in need. But then she is unattractive, like a night hag, with a tawny complexion like a moor, eyes like a gypsy, short in stature, pathetically diminutive, barely casting a shadow when she walks, with less vigor than a burnt log. Fewer supple movements than a smooth pebble. Hush, hush, blasphemer, I interrupted, placing my hand over his mouth. Have I not told you that in mind, body, and circumstance, she embodies the ideal image of the wife I have passionately envisioned? Oh, ho, so the objection does not lie with you. It seems to lie with her, then. She finds nothing worthy of esteem in you. Pray tell me, for what faults do you think she would reject you? I cannot say. It is inconceivable that she would ever hesitate on such a question. Me, me, that axe of fielding would consider me. Inconceivable indeed. You, who are repulsive in appearance, a fool in intellect, a villain in morals, deformed, withered, vain, foolish and malevolent, that someone like her would choose you as an idol. Please, my friend, I said anxiously, do not jest. By mentioning the incredibility of her choice, I did not intend to imply any specific faults on your part. On the contrary, I believe you possess qualities that would make you a desirable partner. You are younger than her, although your demeanor and conversation would suggest an age closer to thirty. You may be financially challenged, but I don't consider these to be insurmountable obstacles. I have heard her eloquently argue against the superficial distinctions of wealth, nationality, and social status. These factors may have been important to her in the past, but her own sufferings, humiliations, and reflections have led her to discard such frivolities. Her experiences have made her acutely aware of the inhuman prejudices perpetuated by religious and political factions, as well as the contempt she has endured from the wealthy, privileged, and intolerant. So, I ask you again, what do you imagine her objections to be? To be honest, I don't know. The mere thought of calling her my wife is an overwhelming prospect, one that makes my head spin with joyous anticipation. However, do you believe that her consent and love are the only prerequisites for attaining this height of bliss? Undoubtedly, her love is essential. Martin, let us sit down and approach this matter with the seriousness it deserves. I can clearly see the significance of this moment for both her happiness and yours. It is evident that you love this woman, and how could you not? Her beauty may not conform to conventional standards, nor does she possess elegant proportions or towering stature yet she possesses a captivating charm that surpasses all physical attributes. 
Her demeanor exudes grace and dignity, born from refined sensibilities, exquisite taste, and a sharp and perceptive mind. She possesses the wisdom of both men and books. Her empathy is guided by reason, and her acts of charity are informed by knowledge. She embodies the wisdom of age, possesses more wealth than you desire, and maintains an impeccable reputation. How could you not fall in love with her? You, her chosen friend, the one who shares her pleasures and engages in her pursuits, the recipient of her exclusive society and trust, bear witness to the strongest evidence of her deep and passionate regard. With such firm love and discernment of her remarkable qualities, how could you not be enchanted? Marriage has not crossed your mind, nor have you suspected your own love. Your pure mind and adoration for this woman have kept your desires contained within the joy of her current companionship, without entertaining hopes beyond this privilege. But imagine how swiftly this tranquility would vanish, and the true state of your heart exposed, if a rival were to enter the scene and be favoured over you. At that moment, the seal would be broken, the spell shattered, and you would awaken to feelings of terror and anguish. Yet I assure you there is no danger of such a situation. Your passion is not one-sided. Though your diffidence hinders your perception, her treatment of you leaves no doubt in my mind that she loves you. I sprang to my feet, overwhelmed by a rush of scorching heat coursing through my entire being. My temples pulsated in sync with my heart, and I found myself in a state of half-delirium. Fear and hope, delight and terror mingled within me in a bewildering amalgamation. What have you done, my friend? You have upended my peace of mind. Until now... The image of this woman brought me comfort and serene ecstasy. But your words have shattered that scene, replacing it with dismay and confusion. You have awakened wishes, dreams, and doubts that persist despite my reasoning and the weight of countless evidence. Good God! You claim that she loves me. Me, a youth in age, raised in ignorant simplicity, barely acquainted with the world, lacking in knowledge and experience, a mere fool, a novice of the fields and hearth. And she... So splendidly endowed, connected to nobility, gifted with talents, and adorned with grace, that she would choose me, me as her partner in fortune, affection, and life. It cannot be. Yet even if it were true, if your speculations were to prove accurate, fool, madman, to entertain such a fatal illusion, such a reckless dream. My friend, my friend, you have inflicted an irreparable injury upon me. I can never face her again. I can never be in her company. These new thoughts will haunt and torment me. I will be consumed by restlessness, and my tongue will be bound. The overflowing gratitude and innocent joy that have endeared me to her will vanish from my countenance and demeanour. I will be anxious, absent-minded, and miserable in her presence. I will dread to look at her or speak, fearing that my mad and unholy ambition will be revealed. Well, replied Stevens, this is an unexpected turn of events. I almost pity you. I did not anticipate this, although knowing your character, perhaps I should have. This is a necessary part of the drama. Certainty and joy in such circumstances must always be preceded by suspense and doubt, and the culmination will be all the more joyous as the prelude is agonizing. Go to bed, my dear friend, and contemplate on this. Time and a few more encounters with Mrs. Fielding will, I believe, resolve everything. I entered my bedroom, but my state of mind was entirely different from when I had left it just a few hours earlier. As I lay down on the mattress and extinguished the light, a flood of new images rushed into my mind, immediately stirring me once again. Everything felt rapid, indistinct and undefined, wearing down my attention and causing distraction. I was awakened as if by a divine voice proclaiming, Sleep no more, rest shall evade you forever. The predominant sensation that gripped me was an unnamed terror. How can I describe it? It felt as though one were falling from a tree into a swirling torrent gasping and struggling while sinking, never to rise again. That is precisely how I felt at that moment. In fact, such an image seemed to possess me. It was one of my reveries, where suddenly I stretched out my hand and grasped the arm of a chair. This action brought me back to reason, or rather allowed my soul to wander into a new, equally chaotic path. Was it the abruptness of this vision that bewildered me so? Was there an inherent flaw in my moral constitution that this new situation brought to the surface? These were all indications of a mind losing itself, becoming disoriented, and descending into a dreary state of insanity. Nothing less could have caused such fantastical thoughts. Despite it being midnight, 
The solitude of my chamber was unbearable. After a few restless turns across the floor, I left the room and the house. I walked without a purpose at a hurried pace. I instinctively made my way straight to Mrs. Fielding's house. I reached for the latch, but the door did not open. It was undoubtedly locked. How is this? I questioned, looking around me. I had acted impulsively, taking this path out of habit. How is this? I repeated to myself, bewildered by my own actions. Locked upon me. But I will summon them, I assure you, I exclaimed, and I rang the bell with force, not timidly or lightly. Someone hurried down from upstairs. I caught a glimpse of candlelight through the keyhole. Strange, I thought, a candle in broad daylight. The door was opened, and there stood my dear Bess, hastily and carelessly dressed. She started at the sight of me, momentarily failing to recognize me. Ah, Martin, is it you? Come inside. My mother has been wanting you for the past two hours. I was just about to send Philip to fetch you. Lead me to her, I requested. She led me into the parlor. Wait here for a moment. I will inform her of your arrival, she said, and swiftly left the room. Soon I heard footsteps approaching. The door opened once more, and a man entered. He was tall, refined, and carried an air of solemnity. There was something in his appearance and attire that indicated he was a foreigner, possibly a Frenchman. What, he said in a gentle tone, is your business with my wife? She cannot see you immediately, so she sent me to receive your message. My wife, I seek Mrs. Fielding, I exclaimed. Indeed, and Mrs. Fielding is my wife. Thankfully, I have arrived in time to discover her and claim her as such. I recoiled in shock. I trembled. My limbs weakened, and I instinctively reached out to grasp onto something to prevent myself from collapsing to the floor. Meanwhile, Fielding's expression transformed into anger and fury. He called me a villain, ordered me to leave, and drew a gleaming blade from his chest, with which he stabbed me in the heart. I fell to the ground, and darkness and oblivion enveloped me. Gradually I began to regain consciousness. I opened my eyes. The haze dissipated, and I found myself lying on my bed in my own chamber. I remembered the fatal blow I had suffered. I placed my hand over my chest, where the dagger had pierced me. There was no evidence of a wound. It was as if a miracle had occurred, and I was unscathed. I lifted myself up, examining my body once more. The surroundings were silent until a voice from below announced that it was past three o'clock. What? I exclaimed. Has all of this wretched spectacle, this midnight wandering, and this ominous meeting has been nothing more than a dream? To clarify this scene and to demonstrate the turmoil in my mind during that night, I must mention information that Eliza had disclosed a few days later. She revealed that at around two o'clock that night, she was awakened by a loud ringing of the bell. The untimely summons startled her. She slept in a room adjacent to Mrs. Fielding's and hesitated on whether or not to wake her friend. However, since the bell was not rung again, she decided not to disturb her. Additionally, Mrs. Stevens reported that on the same night, about thirty minutes after her husband and I retired, she thought she heard the front door open and close. But since nothing else happened, she assumed she was mistaken. I have no doubt that in my feverish and agitated sleep, I truly went out, went to Mrs. Fielding's home, rang the bell for entry, and then shortly returned to my own room. The confusion in my mind was somewhat alleviated by the arrival of daylight. However, it gave way to more consistent but equally dismal and despairing perceptions. Axe's image filled my thoughts, but it only foretold humiliation and sorrow. I found it impossible to uproot the conviction of my own unworthiness, to convince myself that Stevens's assessment of her affection towards me was accurate, and that revealing my thoughts would not provoke her anger and sadness. In this frame of mind, I could not bring myself to see her. To reveal my emotions would surely cause her anger and distress, but concealing them from her scrutiny was beyond my ability. What would she think of my absence from her company? How could I honestly justify my withdrawal, and what could I do to fill the void of those precious hours spent with her? This afternoon, I pondered, she has accepted an invitation to Stedman's country estate on Scoilkill. I was meant to accompany her, but I am only fit for solitude. My behavior in her presence will be perplexing, erratic, and sullen. I cannot go, but what will she make of my absence? Not going will be harmful and suspicious. I was torn. The appointed hour arrived and I stood at my window, grappling with a multitude of conflicting thoughts and emotions. 
I approached my door several times, even placing my foot on the first step of the staircase, but each time I reconsidered and returned to my room. The hour slipped by in this state of indecision. No messenger arrived from Mrs. Fielding inquiring about my delay. Was she angry at my neglect? Was she ill and unable to attend? Or had she changed her mind? I recalled her parting words from our last meeting. Could they be interpreted in two ways? She said my visit had been too long and told me to leave. Did she suspect my presumption and plan to punish me? This fear only compounded my previous anxieties. I could not rest in this state of uncertainty. I would go to her, confess all the pain in my heart and not spare myself. She would not reproach me more harshly than I would reproach myself. I would hear my fate from her own lips and promise to submit to the sentence of separation and exile she would pronounce. I set out for her house. The drawing room and summer house were empty. I called for Philip the footman, as his mistress was out at Mr. Stedman's. What? To Stedman's? With whom? Miss Stedman and her brother came in their carriage and convinced her to go with them. My heart sank at the mention of Miss Stedman's brother, a young man who was confident, flamboyant, and had just returned from Europe with all the trappings of education and wealth. She had gone with him, even though she was already promised to me. Poor Martin, how he was despised. This news only heightened my impatience. I left but returned in the evening, waiting until eleven, but she did not return. The interval until the next morning was filled with sleepless restlessness. I wandered into the fields, my impatience growing with each passing moment. She will likely spend tomorrow at Stedman's, and perhaps the next day. Why should I wait for her return? Why not seek her out and end this agonizing uncertainty? Why not go there now? This night will be sleepless wherever I spend it. I will go. It is almost midnight, and the distance is over eight miles. I will wait near the house until morning, and then demand an audience as soon as possible. I knew Stedman's villa well, having visited with Mrs. Fielding before. I entered the grounds quickly, and approached the house, gazing mournfully at every window. I saw a light in one of the windows, and took different positions to try and identify the people inside. At one point, I thought I saw a glimpse of a woman who I imagined was Axa. I sat on the lawn, about a hundred feet from the house and across from the window with the light. I watched it until someone came to the window, opened it, and leaned on her arms to look out. The day before had been oppressively hot, but the night was a welcome relief. The moon shone down on me as I approached the house, unsure if she even noticed my presence. I didn't care about proper etiquette or decorum. I just wanted to be near her. We stood in silence until I positioned myself directly beneath her window. I spoke first, unsure of what to say. She responded with a startled voice, demanding to know who I was and why I was there. "'It's Martin Slot, your friend from two days ago,' I replied. Her questions came fast and frantic, wondering if anyone was sick or if there was an emergency. I assured her that everything was fine, but that I had come to see her as soon as possible. She was confused and frightened, but I promised to explain everything at sunrise in the cedar grove by the riverbank. Without waiting for a response, I turned and hurried away from the house. I wandered through the grove until I found a secluded spot with a rustic table and chairs hidden from view. This was where I had decided my fate would be sealed. As I left that spot, my mind was in disarray, and I wandered aimlessly along the obscure paths, sometimes speeding up, sometimes slowing down, depending on the whims of my thoughts. Describing those thoughts is impossible for they were the product of a temporary loss of reason. Only madness could have led me down such bewildering tracks, dragging me down to a depth of hopelessness and helplessness so suddenly, and laying waste all the structures of my mind in an instant, reducing them to a scene of confusion and horror. What did I fear? What did I hope? What did I intend? I cannot say. My dark feelings were to be dispelled with the night. The only thing that mattered was the upcoming meeting with Axa, that was the boundary of my fluctuating and uncertain emotions. It was there that my fate would be sealed and ratified. I pushed through the thicket and climbed upwards until I reached the edge of a steep precipice. I lay down on the rock and pressed my exposed and throbbing chest against its cold and hard surface. I leaned over the edge and stared at the water, weeping copiously, but I couldn't say why. I had wandered so far from Stedman's that when I was awakened by the light, I had to walk several miles to get to our meeting place. Axa was already there. I slid down the rock above and appeared before her. 
She was startled by my wild and abrupt appearance. Without saying a word, I sat down opposite her, crossing my arms on the table and resting my head on them while my face was turned towards her and my eyes fixed on hers. I seemed to have lost the power and the desire to speak. At first, she regarded me with anxious curiosity, but after scrutinizing my appearance, she was overwhelmed with terrified sorrow. For God's sake, what is happening? Why have I been summoned here? What news, what dreadful news do you bring? I maintained my position without speaking. What, she continued, could cause such sorrow? Don't keep me in this suspense, Martin. Your silence and expression distress and trouble me too deeply. Distress you? I finally spoke. I have come to tell you what I cannot articulate now that I am here. I paused. Please say it. I implore you. You appear so unhappy, such a change from yesterday. Yes, from yesterday. Everything was peaceful and joyous then, but now everything is... I couldn't continue. What are these words, Martin? And from you? It is impossible for you to be guilty. If purity exists on earth, it resides within your heart. What have you done? I have dared. How little you expect the extent of my audacity. That someone like me should aspire to such heights. I stood up and took her hands in mine as she sat, gazing earnestly into her face. I have come only to beg for your forgiveness, to confess my transgression, and then disappear forever. But first, let me see if there is any sign of forgiveness. Your countenance, it is kind, heavenly, compassionate still. I will trust it. I believe in it. And yet, I released her hands and turned away. This offense is beyond the reach of even your mercy. How greatly your words and demeanor distress me. Please tell me the worst. I cannot bear this confusion any longer. Why? I quickly turned back and took her hands once again. That Slort, whom you have honored and trusted and blessed with your affection, has been... What has he been? Incomparably admirable. A hero in his virtue, I'm certain. What else has he been? This Slort has imagined has dared. Will you forgive him? Forgive you for what? Why don't you speak? Do not keep my soul in this suspense she pleaded. He has dared, but do not think that I am referring to you. Continue to look at me as you are now, and reserve your accusing glances, the punishment in your eyes, for someone who is absent. Why are you weeping then at last? That is a favorable sign. When pity falls from the eyes of our judge, then the supplicant should approach. Now with confidence in your forgiveness I will tell you, this slot, not satisfied with all that you have granted him thus far, has dared to love you, even to consider you as his wife. Her gaze dropped beneath mine, and she covered her face with her hands. I see my fate, I said, filled with despair. I predicted all too well the effect of this confession, but I will leave unforgiven. She partially uncovered her face, withdrawing her hand from her cheek and reaching out toward me. She looked at me and said, Martin, I do forgive you. The way she uttered those words, the expression on her face... The cheek that was once pale with fear now blushed with a different emotion, and joy sparkled in her eyes. Could I be mistaken? My doubts, my newly born fears made me tremble as I accepted her offered hand. Surely, I faltered, I am not, I cannot be so blessed. There was no need for words. The hand I held spoke volumes. She remained silent. Surely, I said, my senses deceive me. Such bliss cannot be meant for me. Tell me once more, ease my doubting heart. She surrendered herself to my embrace. I cannot find the words. Let your own heart tell you, you have made your axa. At that moment, Miss Stedman's voice called out, Mrs. Fielding, where are you? My beloved friend suddenly stood up and in a hurried voice told me to leave. You must not be seen by this frivolous girl. Come over tonight as if I had invited you, and I will accompany you home, she said. Her words left me in a daze, unable to move. The blissful state I was in cannot be described adequately. If I cannot convey the image of my state before the meeting, my feelings after are beyond words. As instructed by my mistress, I hurried away, avoiding any paths that would draw attention. I shared my joy with my friends and spent the day in a state of solemn but confused rapture. I did not describe each aspect of my happiness. It all came at me at once, too fast for me to comprehend. In the evening I went to Stedman's and saw Axa. Her words and expressions confirmed that everything that had happened was real. She made excuses for leaving early, and her friend accompanied her to the city. After dropping off Mrs. Fielding, I returned to Axa's house.
eager and impatient. I could repeat every conversation we've had since then, but there's no need to write it down. It's all equally important, and it would take volumes to capture it all. It's already deeply imprinted in my memory, and reviewing the past would be neglecting the present. Whatever I write down would take away from the moment, and that is impossible to do justice to. I write to you now to calm the tumult that arises from our necessary separation, to help me find some patience until the time comes when we can be together in both body and mind, forever united. May nothing happen to prevent that time, though I cannot imagine what could. But why do these ominous doubts arise now? My love has infected me with unworthy fears, for she shares them too. This morning I recounted my dream to her. She started and grew pale. A somber silence followed, replacing the cheerfulness that had prevailed before. Why so downcast, my friend? I despise your dream. It is a dreadful thought. I wish it had never occurred to you. Surely you don't place any faith in dreams. I don't know where to place my faith. Not in my present promises of joy, she replied, weeping. I tried to soothe and console her. I asked why she was crying. My heart is heavy. Previous disappointments weighed so heavily on me, and the hopes that were shattered resemble my current one so closely that the fear of a similar outcome intrudes upon my thoughts. And now your dream. Indeed, I don't know what to do. Perhaps I should retract my decision, or at least postpone an irrevocable act. Once again, I had to go through my list of arguments to persuade her to uphold her favorable resolution to become mine within the week. Eventually I succeeded in restoring her calmness and alleviating her fears by dwelling on our future happiness. I painted a picture of our household while we remained in America, and how in a year or two we would journey to Europe. We would seek out fidelity, skill, and pure morals, enticing them with generous rewards to join our domestic service. Our duties would be light and regular. I described the amusements and activities we would engage in both abroad and at home. Would this not be true happiness? Oh yes, if it can truly be so she responded. It will be so, I assured her, but this is only a preliminary outline of the life we will create. There is still something more to add, something that will complete our bliss. What more can be added? she inquired. What more? I echoed, astonished. Can Axa truly ask what more? She, who has not only been a wife... But why am I indulging in this idle writing? I interrupted myself, questioning the purpose of my words. The hour has come for my return to her. Farewell, dear Quill. Rest comfortably in your leather case until I call for you, which won't be any time soon. I believe I will renounce your company until everything is settled with my beloved. Yes, I will renounce you. So let this be your final duty until Slot is made the happiest of men. The End This concludes The Enigma of Martin Slot, a gothic fiction novel. Written by H. Wilhelm Starkweather Narrated by William Heath. Visit brooksaudiobooks.com for updates on the availability of new books and a special free offer.